Right, in this um, sit next section, we'll be looking at master storytelling. What is master storytelling? How does it work? Um, so how do we use master storytelling insights to drive our fundraising propositions? Um, and just to say, this is a huge subject. Uh, what we'll do um, is it uh, will give you a kind of a brief overview of what master storytelling is, but um, so it's this in no way really touches the edges of master storytelling because um, there's so much to think about and include um, so it's, um, when we work with meta-narratives. So just to briefly say, master storytelling is when we work with meta-narratives. And these are the implicit narratives that sit under everything we do. And uh, um, these meta-narratives communicate values, motivation and purpose. And therefore, if we want to create powerful fundraising propositions, then um, we need to work with these three uh, primitives in a different way to which we normally work with. And how do we do that? What does that look like? And how do we use uh, insights from storytelling to take us to a very different paradigm altogether in terms of working with our higher values, higher motivation, and leading to a stronger, much more authentic and richer purpose that drives uh, everything that we do. So to do that, unfortunately, we have to do some kind of taking apart of some pretty much uh, held beliefs in terms of how we think um, and explore new ways of um, sit approaching some of these deep problems that we see today. So this comes back to, um, it's, uh, a, again, we're going to be talking about paradigms, is one of the most uh, influential paradigms, which is called the Cartesian paradigm, which comes from Rene Descartes, who um, famously said, I think, therefore I am. So the idea that our thinking is who we are. So we tend to over-identify our rational thinking with who I am. So we end up with this kind of control tower model, um, so it's triangle of thinking. And if you've seen like um, so usually um, images of um, icebergs where above the water you have this little peak and below you have this uh, massive kind of uh, part of the iceberg, we tend to think of the conscious being this very small part and the unconscious being what lies below the surface of our attention. Um, so it's, and our rational thought is at the top making all the decisions, um, so it's calling all the shots and it's our rational thinking which is in control. Now, there's a problem with this um, because it's entirely wrong. Our rational thinking is not in control. We tend to think that it is. And why that is, um, we'll come on to a second. But most of our strategies, our ways of engaging audiences, we tend to play to um, so it's just the rational part of the mind. So we tend to create the propositions, um, information of why we should take um, action on climate change. We tend to um, do fundraising propositions that play to the rationalizing mind to make clear and coherent um, ways that we need to engage on these issues. Um, and we tend to overlook that vastness of the unconscious, the pre-conscious, unconscious drivers that shape pretty much everything we do. And I've seen this in a lot of um, so it's, uh, kind of fundraising propositions where most of the talk is around how do we create uh, a good story as a storyteller, really important. And that's a who, what, where, when, why. Um, maybe we might talk about some, how do we frame some of the subjects covered in that story, especially when we're talking about issues like climate change. Do we move away from climate change to rapid warming as a reframing of that message? And we spend a lot of time around the narrative, getting the words just right and yet at the same time, pretty much ignoring everything that's happening and the meta-narrative and the implicit aspect of all that we do. And this is because we're trapped in a paradigm, the Cartesian paradigm. We think that we our rational thinking is what controls our motivation. And there's no evidence to show that whatsoever. And yet we act as if that is the fundamental truth. So we tend to think about uh, if we give the right information, data in, the behaviour will pop out. Um, so it's, and this is uh, uh, what's called a homo economicus kind of worldview. This idea that uh, so it's, we make rational decisions based on what is um, optimal for us and we'll uh, so kind of choose what is best for us um, and 
once we've chosen what's best for us from uh, kind of uh, weighing up the pros and cons, our behaviours will reflect that. That is entirely false. Um, so it's how we know that from marketing. Um, so where um, very few marketing messages today, modern marketing messages, plays to that homo economicus kind of um, so it's anthropology. So we tend to play much more to more sophisticated um, so it's relational way in, in terms of driving our marketing messages and move away from this kind of over rationalistic mindset. But within the charity sector, we, we still tend to stick to this control tower model. It's, it's pretty much universal in everything we do. And if you haven't heard of Emil Gilchrist, I'm sure you will do um, sit, um, soon, um, sit because he is very influential in terms of proposing an entirely new theory on how we actually think. And some of the insights he offers are incredible. And they really do open the door in terms of um, sit, thinking about uh, again, those primitives of how do you work with motivation, how do you work with purpose and values, and it gives a whole new insight into um, it's, um, how we can bring about real and meaningful change on some of the biggest issues we face. Because if we take climate change as a perfect example, um, the information has been given uh, and communicated. Um, there's been um, a huge political pressure to bring about the urgent changes needed for us to take urgent action on the climate crisis. And yet we still seem to struggle. We still don't seem to have the motivation. We have the information, we have the emotional storytelling, we've had the passion of um, communities around the world saying that they really, really value caring for the earth. But we seem to lack the motivation to put all of this into practice. So why is that? And that's because we've been focusing only on one hemisphere of the brain. So let's think about how we actually think the way we think we think is not actually how we think how we tend to think that um, so it's the, that rational mind is the one that's in, in control so we have this old model of the two hemispheres of the brain and this is called um, if you're interested it's called hemispheric lateralization which means uh, what do the two different hemispheres do and the old thinking um, comes from kind of like a pop psychology uh, was pretty much that the right hemisphere was the creative one. It does all the art and music and all, all those different aspects. It's the emotional center. And the left hemisphere is the analytical center. It does all the maths, computations, and then works everything out. And that's not true at all. Um, what seems to be the case is that when we do analysis, we use both hemispheres. When we do creativity, we use both hemispheres. So the idea that one does one thing, the other does another thing is entirely incorrect. What seems to be the case, and and this is how the, um, the Ian McGilchrist's work is, is really kind of groundbreaking, it's not that they the two hemispheres do different things, but they do the same thing, but differently. And this offers another insight into why we have two hemispheres of the brain um, and why they are joined in the middle by what's called the corpus callosum, which is um, a fibrous uh, tissues that connects the two hemispheres. And when we study the corpus callosum, um, so it's, it works as an inhibitor. It, it keeps the two hemispheres apart. It doesn't really get them communicating as much. It tries to keep them separate to make sure they're both doing their tasks differently. So that's really interesting. And also, um, so it's the two hemispheres are asymmetrical, so they're different shapes. So th they're not replicas of each other. They both have um, so a different job to do. So what, what do we now know about the two hemispheres of the brain? So the left hemisphere, um, so it's, uh, with insights from neuropsychology, we now know the left hemisphere deals with narrow attention. Uh, it's much more goal orientated. Uh, it's much uh, deals with abstract ideas. Uh, it only deals with represented data. So um, all information comes from the right hemisphere and it's represented to the left. So it only deals with secondhand information, if you if you will. Uh, it tends to categorize, put things into boxes in order to control them and understand them. It likes repeatability. It's very literal and factual. Um, it's very um, self-absorbed and dogmatic. It only thinks about itself. 
Um, it also is a driver for this endless bureaucracy in order to create systems of process. It creates um, bureaucracy to make sure that um, so everything fits into place. And it prefers rhythm, um, so it's um, repetitive kind of um, so it's sound. The right hemisphere, by contrast, is broad attention. It is vigilant, it looks out. It tends to see the bigger context, it tends to understand the, the whole picture. It likes to empathize, it tries to connect and create relationships. It deals with metaphor, um, so as well as poetry and myth, um, it deals with those aspects. It is very self-aware and reflective. Um, it deals with time, space and depth differently to the left hemisphere. And it prefers melody rather than rhythm. So it has a very different function in terms of um, the way it sees and interprets the same information. So the theory why we have two hemispheres comes out of um, so it's a very basic need that uh, you can see in all animals and all humans um, so it's, is that when you are, um, so it's, let's say you're a little bird, you, you have two roles that you have to do simultaneously at the same time. So you have to look at the food on the floor. So that's a narrow tension. You look down at the seed on the floor and you, to feed yourself. But whilst you're feeding yourself, you also have, at the same time, broad attention to look out for pr um, predators. So the right hemisphere can do the lookout, look at the big picture, uh, spot the intention of a predator close by, while the left hemisphere can look down, break things down and manipulate things into smaller parts so that you can eat it. So you can see that there's um, these two basic functions are embedded within nature and um, so it's, they represent two different states of thinking that happen at the same time. So therefore, everything we do, we do uh, with two hemispheres. We have two brains working simultaneously, doing very different things. And in our culture, we tend to prefer the left hemisphere. We like the left hemisphere because the left hemisphere deals with explicit information. It deals with narrative, it deals with language, and it deals with things. Uh, so the left hemisphere um, so it's, is better at manipulation, so it gives us power. That's why we like the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere is much more implicit. So it deals with implicit information, and it deals with meta-narratives. So the left deals with narratives, the right with meta-narratives, the implicit story being told in everything that we do. And it's non-verbal and deals with relationships. So if you like, the left hemisphere deals with things, the right hemisphere deals with the relationship between things and together they work really well. But they work best when the right hemisphere is more in charge and the left hemisphere plays more of a servant role. And in our culture, we have it the other way around. We um, put the left hemisphere in charge and the right hemisphere plays a more servant role. And there are huge problems with that. And we won't go into all of that because that requires a lot of unpacking. But what's interesting from a fundraising proposition, um, fundraising perspective, is the hierarchy of attention. Is that the right hemisphere sees the big picture first, sees what is real, it absorbs that information and represents it to the left hemisphere, who then bring, breaks it down into language, into boxes, into things in order to understand it. So the right um, deals with the, uh, all the information first, presents it to the left, and the left breaks it down. And what should happen is the left should return to the right and say, actually, does that make sense? In our culture, we don't tend to do that. We tend to prefer the left hemisphere's take on the world. And what does that mean from a storytelling perspective? So when we tell stories, uh, we have two stories being told at the same time. The narrative, which is explicit, the who, what, where, when, why, which all the content and all the outcomes, and the implicit narrative, which is um, the meta narrative, which conveys meaning, purpose, values, and all the rest. These are all implicit in everything we do. So when we look at storytelling, something quite interesting happens at a storytelling kind of perspective, is that you have the two hemispheres working in different ways with every story we tell. So think about uh, when I tell a story to you, I am giving you information, I'm giving you the characters, the time, the place, the whereabouts. Um, so I've got the narrative which I'm communicating to you. 
So that is called the narrative and that is externally regulated. So I'm giving you information from outside and that's moving to you. So it's an outside information to win. Meta narratives are different. They don't emerge from the storyteller. They're implied by the storyteller. Actually, the audience narrates the meta narrative. So you have two different flow states. One, which is a narrative, which is extrinsic flow state and meta narrative, which is an intrinsic flow state. So meta narratives are uh, implied in the story. So let's say you're reading Harry Potter as a good, good example. Um, so it's, you might be reading a story about this wonderful um, so it's school of wizardry called Hogwarts. And if you're reading the book, um, so it's the description of, the, of the, what Hogwarts is like will be laid out in the narrative. But it's up to us as the audience to imagine what that place looks like. It's up to us to put colours, to give shape to what is being implied by the storyteller. So storytelling is a co-created act. It is information received, but it also is, uh, relies on the audience to engage and bring their own interpretation to the story. So that's why stories are never single acts. Uh, and how we receive stories is very different to how other people might receive stories because we bring ourselves into the narrative. And we do this almost unconsciously um, sits and we do it with great ease, not realizing what a strange thing this is when we listen to stories that we are co creating the story alongside the narrator. So, we for interest from our side is that we have two different flow states one which is an extrinsic flow state, and this is an out to win flow state, and it's narrowing of attention. So think about uh, arrows coming in. So that's your extrinsic flow state. Intrinsic flow state, which comes from the right hemisphere, is an in to out flow state, and it's broad attention. So it looks out to the bigger picture. The left breaks everything down into its smallest part, and the right um, looks at the bigger picture and tries to see about a bigger context. And this has huge implications for the way we think, the way we um, try to derive problems, because most of our problems uh, if in academia, we tend to break everything down. We tend to use the left hemisphere to analyze and understand the world around us. So when it comes to creating uh, kind of meaningful solutions to big issues like climate change, we tend to use the left hemisphere and try to find logical and rational ways of engaging audiences on these issues. Uh, which makes no sense because the issues arise from the right hemisphere. So how do we think about the bigger picture? How do we use storytelling, sense of belonging, look at some of the meta narratives that are implied in everything we do? And there's very few people um, from my experience working in the climate movement who are even looking at meta narratives, who are even looking at the implicit narratives that underpin everything we do and tend to go back to tell the same story again and again, hoping things will change. So the left hemisphere gets caught in a logic trap. It tends to think it has the answer to the problem, um, but it doesn't see that it created the problem in the first place. So we have what's called a paradigm trap. Um, we get go, going round and round telling the same story, thinking that things will change if only people will understand the science more on climate change. If people will only understand um, it, um, the, how urgent it is. And maybe if we raise the profile of climate change, um, people will act. And again, we're telling the same story, not really understanding um, it, that uh, climate crisis is a relational crisis. It's not a technical um, it's a crisis to be solved, but it goes much deeper in, in terms of how we relate and understand our place in the world and also the values and motivation and all these other aspects which are held by the right hemisphere. So we tend to um, get stuck in left hemisphere thinking and we can't get out of it. So these flow states are really important, especially when we come on to our new motivation model, which we'll look at later. So the left hemisphere has an extrinsic flow state it likes to manipulate and it likes to apprehend and apprehension is comes from the latin ad apprehendra to hold on to to manipulate so it seeks power manipulation or it seeks pleasure so that's the values ecology of the left hemisphere very important we remember that right hemisphere is an intrinsic flow state it likes to encounter and likes to comprehend 
and that is from the Latin um, so it's com and prehendra to hold together to understand and its values ecology is towards self transcendence to relate and to connect and to bring everything into wholeness so we have two very different values ecologies from the two different hemispheres and we tend to play most of our fundraising propositions to the left hemisphere which is around pleasure or reward and when we look at the motivation model um, this will make more sense as we move on to it but very broadly speaking um, since we can map two different engines to the two different hemispheres of the brain when we use the left hemisphere to true trying to make sense of the world we tend to use the values of the left hemisphere and the values of the left hemisphere are tend to be extrinsic values because it always seeks utility purpose um is it power or manipulation that's what the left hemisphere is designed to do so therefore when we use the left hemisphere we tend to lean towards extrinsic motivation extrinsic purpose and extrinsic values and they're the three primitives that uh, underpin everything we do now, if we move to the right hemisphere, we move to a different paradigm altogether. And this is called the storytelling paradigm. And the storytelling paradigm is not about telling stories, because um, we tell stories anyway. It's how we tell stories in a different way that work with the three primitives of intrinsic motivation, intrinsic purpose, and therefore intrinsic values. So this is a very different engine altogether. And um, I would argue that uh, if we want to see real and meaningful change on some of the biggest issues we face today, um, if we want to create powerful fundraising propositions that lead to long-term behavioural change and a long-term donor retention, we need to move away from the marketing paradigm altogether. We need to move away from all forms of extrinsic motivation and we need to learn how to work with intrinsic motivation by using insights from neuropsychology that show how the right hemisphere thinks, what its values are, and then place all of our fundraising propositions towards the values ecology of the right hemisphere. Pretty straightforward, kind of. So in order to do that, we need to do some kind of deep thinking around how we do everything. So a lot of this is very challenging work because it is critiquing some of the uh, fundamentals that we, we just assume to be true we haven't even thought about moving from extrinsic to intrinsic or we, we we think that we're already doing intrinsic motivation because we're doing positive storytelling we're showing us it's um, images of volunteers smiling having fun or people doing a beach clean and if we use these images we're using intrinsic motivation to drive behavior actually it's the other way around um, so it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that well, when we get on to intrinsic motivation um, so it's, it doesn't work around pleasure it works with different um, dynamics and how do we work with those dynamics in order to try to create long-term behavioral change so we have the two engines um, so the marketing engine and the storytelling engine these engines, um, so when we apply them to our work, work in very different ways. So the market engine, um, traditional marketing, is you have your audience and you have the product. So the question is, how do you get your audience to buy your product? The best way to do that, uh, to engage your audiences, is to create anxiety or to play to our lower values, or um, sit greed, that you'll get something in return, that you'll be happier with this next purchase or upgrade. So the marketing paradigm works best when you play to your lower values and works best when you use extrinsic motivation. So that is the paradigm we're stuck in. So if we're trying to create positive change on some of the biggest, biggest issues we face today, especially climate change and uh, global poverty, if we're using marketing paradigm to drive that change is that we're creating um, kind of short term kind of actions, but we're not leading to the psychological foundations needed to create long term behavioral change. Because long term behavioral change happens when you engage uh, your higher values, which are intrinsic values. So until we move to a new engine and in this image we have the heart representing this new engine um, so it's we work in a very different way so instead of pointing audience to the product 
And we see this within the private sector. Um, so it's, um, a lot of organizations are already doing this. Instead of taking audience to the product, you show the product in service to a higher purpose and you tell stories to that higher purpose and how your product is something which helps you to get to your higher purpose. And just to make sense of that, um, let's look at two marketing propositions, one from a pretend uh, climate charity and the other one from a pretend um, is it electric vans company. They both have uh, come with uh, to the market with the same uh, marketing proposition. Uh, so it's the climate uh, charity uh, are using, it's the small changes that make a difference. And uh, we have an image of people together planting, doing small things that make positive change. Um, and then when we look at Electric Vans Company, they are got the same proposition. It's a small change that make a difference. But in this context, it means something else. So. When I go around um, different organizations and I've even worked with some of the experts in communication and fundraising and in marketing, and I ask them the question, which one is storytelling and which one is marketing? Almost always, um, so it's everyone chooses A as storytelling and B as marketing because you're marketing a van. But actually, when we look at the hidden dynamics, the implicit kind of dynamics that sit within um, the communication is that the evans is doing storytelling because it's pointing its product in service to a higher purpose and marketing is pointing um, to its, your audience to the product and the product for a charity is to to do the small things that make a difference so in storytelling it works best if you play to your higher values and in marketing in order to really drive motivation for people to get off their bottoms and do something positive for the climate actually it works better if you play to fear and anxiety that we need to take urgent action right now um, we need to um, jump up and down and do something so uh, marketing works best when you play to lower values storytelling works best when you play to higher values um, and this might feel somewhat confusing because we tend to um, six, um, confuse our cause with our purpose. So if you're working to um, six, to address climate change, we tend to think that is our purpose. But actually, that's not. That is your product. If you're a charity, that is your product which you're trying to get your audience to engage with. So therefore, the question is, how do you get your audience to engage with your product, but it's in service to a higher purpose? And you can see why this gets very difficult for charities to do. It's much easier for um, a van company to do this because what they say is our vans are helping to make um, the world a better place in terms of using electric vans. So you have the product, which is lower values in service to higher values. But what happens when you're higher up the value spectrum um, as a charity, when you're already working with higher values, is how do you get um, is it your audience to work with even higher values that are beyond um, is it protecting the environment? And this is where we get into some of the kind of deeper um, is it, um, issues around meta narratives and how to create what's called an intrinsic flow state. How do you work with lower values in service to higher? Um, and we cover this in a lot more detail in our values trading program. But I'm just touching upon this very briefly just to give you an insight around the difference between storytelling and marketing and how they are completely different. So back to our earlier problem, which is the false dichotomy between the values frame and the fundraising frame. The idea that um, if we're either we're fundraising um, so it, we're trying to create the motivation for people to give and it works best if you play to lower values or we're playing to a values frame and that way you're weakening your fundraising proposition because you're playing to higher values and that is because uh, we are stuck in the marketing paradigm higher values um, weaken your fundraising proposition within a marketing mindset Higher values in a storytelling mindset strengthens your proposition.
So therefore, we need to think about how do we move to a storytelling paradigm. Um, so it's if we want to move away from um, this false dichotomy where we're trying to fundraise, but also do it in, in an ethical way. Because when we move to um, so it's a uh, so it's storytelling paradigm, it's almost we don't have to think about the ethical implications because we're not playing to the um, old-fashioned, simple marketing propositions of um, show anxiety and show how donating will be the magic solution, which is pretty much a marketing methodology. Um, that's the methodology that plays to lazy stereotypes and tropes. Um, that's the, um, so it's the dynamics that creates the savior, um, so it's um, hero, um, so it's in the audience, and the um, so it's beneficiaries as the helpless victims. So until we move away from marketing altogether to a storytelling paradigm, do we um, so not only create stronger um, so values propositions, not only do we create uh, so work within a more ethical um, storytelling framework, we also work with higher values and higher stages of motivation, which leads to long-term behavioral change. This is where all charities need to be, but we're nowhere near that yet. So how do we move away from the marketing paradigm, which is one of the most dangerous paradigms uh, today, I would argue, to a storytelling paradigm where we play with intrinsic values, intrinsic motivation and intrinsic purpose and how to work with those three primitives in a more coherent and cohesive way and integrate these into everything that we do. And in order to do that, we need to look at different tensions. So let's have a look at the different tensions of the two hemispheres and how to apply them within our fundraising propositions.